Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We will start in a few um, seconds. And my apologies for the sound that, you know, I, I couldn't uh, stop it, but uh, we'll try to kind of, um, to make the, the, the webinar uh, go smoothly and as much as we can. Um, before I start, I'd like to kind of introduce myself and the, the webinar series that we uh, have been doing. So my name is Osai Besser and I'm one of the Oxbal um, um, co-founders and uh, uh, one of the board members. And so this uh, webinar is uh, one of the um, webinar series that we prepared as part of the second Oxbal Online uh, Research Fellowship. Um, so thank you so much for everybody who uh, joined us. Um, to start with, uh, let me just introduce the uh, panelists. We will start with uh, Soham. Soham is uh, a, an academic doctor at Oxford University. Uh, Soham's academic uh, interests are in neuroscience, global surgery, and medical education. He is also a lecturer in medicine for Oxford University and a teaching associate for the Oxford University Global Surgery Group and an educational and research mentor for students internationally. Uh, so Haim is currently completing a, a public health MSc at, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's passionate about bringing the voices of patients and the public to the table when discussing research or advocacy efforts. Uh, so Haim, thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, please start. And uh, for, the, for the audience, uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to respond uh, as much as I can. Uh, also, you could um, uh, unmute yourself um, during the the at the end of each uh, uh, um, lecture or talk, or in the uh, end um, in the twenty minute Q and A session. Um, so, Ham, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and congratulations for organising all of this and for doing getting such a large turnout it's so encouraging to see 120 plus individuals come it's so late in in the day to one of these talks um, i'm going to talk a bit more about how you can get involved in research as a medical student if you want to get in touch with me here are my contact details um, when i say get in touch um, a lot of my con content here is all about connections collaborations and i think that's really important and by getting in touch i often just have people just contact me but no further ideas and I think something that's really important something I take her messages always go there saying what you want to get out of it what you want to do I think in the down the line if you go down with that kind of approach with a bit more of a an upfront approach with what you want and a bit more of a, a push towards people there's more there's more likely you will be able to get to do research as a medical student as a doctor as a fellow whatever you want just make sure that rather than just connecting, you actually engage in a dialogue as well. And so, yeah, definitely do post any comments or unmute yourself during this talk during any point. Now, there are many ways in which you can get involved in research as a medical student. Um, I've just listed some of the points that I could think of. Um, using my holidays, taking advantage of student-selected components, building a quality improvement project, joining a research collaborative, and doing another degree. I've put something here called an intercalated degree. I know that's not something that you guys uh, maybe have at your universities. This is something that's special to the United Kingdom. It's where you can do a degree within a medical degree. So I did my intercalated degree uh, <laughs> unknowingly on infectious diseases and pandemics. Who knew that would be so relevant? Uh, it's so, so long in the future as it has been these last two years. And also do use your spare time in the evenings when you can to get involved in research. Now, let me talk talk you through these various different points using my prior background. So using your holidays, well, there are various different trusts that offer scholarships and sponsorships for various different research projects. I specifically apply to the Wellcome Trust via the Wellcome Trust Biomedical Vacation Scholarship, which offered me a funded research placement to investigate the neurological impacts of pesticides. And we specifically looked into the Sri Lankan population and specifically into um, one sub, uh, subset of pesticides. And this led to us further understanding about a, diff about a syndrome called intermediate syndrome, as you can see here. And as you can see throughout all of this, the aim is not just to get the research done, but also to disseminate your findings. And there are various different scholarships that you can uh, 
and go for. So the Wellcome Trust is open for both national and international students. There are various different royal colleges across the United Kingdom and uh, elsewhere that offer scholarships for international and national students to come into the UK to do various placements. There are international societies that have research pots for you to do research in your own home country, if you so wish. For example, there's the European societies of neuro neurosurgery, there's the European Society of Pharmacology. They all have their own specific research pot for students such as yourself to get experience in doing research. Do approach them, do approach potential supervisors and get these research grants in place if need be. Um, you can also use student selected modules. Uh, the benefit of those is that your medical school will often be involved. So they would want to put a research supervisor to see, uh, to see through this project to its end. Um, this can be something as simple, as simple as a literature review to something more complex, such as a lab-based research study. It very much depends on how you go about doing things. And even if, for example, it's not something that's groundbreaking, you can definitely present the research. As I said, throughout all of this, you need to be able to disseminate your results as well as just do the actual research in itself because people need to know what you're doing. That's the whole purpose of good scientific practice. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing some, some comments come in. All right. Now, what other research can you do? As I mentioned, you can do clinical research, you can do literature reviews, you can do lab-based projects, you can work with local organizations. So it doesn't have to be within your medical schools. Um, it's not coming from my uh, PC, unfortunately, the sound. Yeah, uh, my apologies. It's, uh, I think it's from the settings and we can't change it since the meeting has started. Uh, so... We'll, we'll try to find a way to do it, but you know, it's, it's not allowing me. Yeah. Sorry for that. So no worries at all. So do collect data where you can and um, try and get this, as I said, at least presented if you can't publish it. Um, you can mute your mic because it's beautiful. Um, sure. All right. What else can you do? So you can build on quality improvement projects. So building a quality, so what is a quality improvement project? A quality improvement project is essentially when you notice that there is something that's not quite right, as in there could be something a bit better. It doesn't meet the gold standard. And for example, let's say you've noticed that there's a heterogeneity in how people go about in doing a, a certain surgical process, or not everyone records a certain thing in the same way. I, no one really knows what the best practice is. You can conduct research. As you can see here, we conducted research to understand how better to stop uh, CSF leakage post skull based surgery. Um, this is all done with loads of medical students across the country, as well as senior uh, clinical staff as well. So, there's, so don't worry if you just have a quality improvement project, you can definitely build on that to get research as we're always trying to figure out what could be done to fix something or is there a different way to approach a certain issue. Next, uh, uh, I just want to come back to what I was talking about in the beginning, which is collaboration instead of competition. I know you're all medical students. I know you're all doing research. And I know at some point you're always doing same kind of research in similar fields. But it's so much better to collaborate together rather than competing. Uh, a phrase that's often used is uh, you can go fast alone, but you go far together. I think that really applies for research, whether it's national, international, whichever discipline you're doing. Working together always leads to better solutions down the line. As long as you, and if you know someone who you can trust and you can work with, it's really promising for the future too. And there are different ways that people have taken collaboration to mean. I'll show you some that weren't so good in collaborative approaches. For example, this study here told all its co-authors that we're doing a collaborative approach. And then obviously they only listed a few as named authors and put everyone else in acknowledgements. This is not a collaborative authorship model. A collaborative authorship model is where everyone is in the authorship line, either as a named author or as a collaborative author. Now, the best way to do this, the gold standard practice, is to have everyone within a collaborative name. So you probably come across the COVID Surge Collaborative, the Global Surge Collaborative. Here you've got the Incision UK Collaborative. This is where all the authors are named underneath this collaborative. So if you click that, you'd get all the named authors underneath that. And everyone's equal. Everyone has the same kind of standing in this paper. No one has suggested that they're more important than another because they, for example, wrote the method section while you did the day in, day out work of data collecting. And that isn't somehow equitable. Um, so this is a much better way of doing collaborative research. And as with anything, 
when you're doing research like this, do make sure that you produce protocols. And that's something you can get easily published as a medical student. So one during this study, I produced a protocol for said study and I got this published. Now the protocol is obviously not something that you do as a huge collaborative. It's something that you do with a group of people. Now that's at least what I thought. Um, now more and more global health protocols and global health studies, um, if this is something you're interested in, are going to different countries, going to different stakeholders and finding out how best should it be conducted. And a really good standard for this is this study here, which essentially conducted a protocol, as you can see here, with the main authors, but they also included all the collaborative authors as well in the protocol, right even before the whole study was published. So as you can see the Global Neurotrauma Outcome Study Collaborative. This, once again, is a testament to the collaborative nature of the authors here, as well as, a as, well as the importance of the collaborative group in truly designing such an international study. So I would actually say whenever you're doing any future international work or, inter or even national work, Think about having a collaborative authorship for the final product and including the collaborative authors, even in your protocol, even when you're a medical student. And that's really important to credit everyone for the work that was essential in producing the final output. Um, if you want to go one step further, you could list every single author of that paper as this, uh, as this study has done here. Um, this would be seen to be maybe unpalatable by a few journals because of the extent of the number of authors on there. As you can see, I'm near number number 20 here, but they go to about a hundred different authors. So it'd be much better just to have a collaborative authorship model as journals are more accepting of that and they won't need to take up the whole page just writing down names of different individuals. But don't worry, if you go down this way, this is still a really good way of showing how everyone's equitable and how you're recognizing everyone's contribution towards this research. Um, now, I as I said, there's another way you can get um, research involved in research, and that's through a different degree. Now, I did an intercalated degree, but it's possible to do other degrees. For example, also the degrees after his medical school career, whether that's PG certs, PG diplomas, master's degrees, even a PhD if need be. And there's really good ways to do research, to get supervisors, and to get published in quite high quality journals. For example, this paper got published in Nature. Um, and as I said, it's not linked to just one degree. I also did a master's I, and I got published in neurosurgery here, in the Lancet here. So you can definitely go beyond, um, well, go beyond, above and beyond what they specifically teach you in that master's degree and try and use the skills that you've learned um, in the variety of domains. Um, thank you very much. That's it for me. I'm so sorry about the sound in the background. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to comment or to ask me later on about how, whether any of this relates to you. And I'm more than happy to talk to any of you in person um, or off this at a later point in time. It's been really enjoyable meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soham. And I'm trying to just turn off the, uh, the sound. So give me a few seconds and I will start my presentation. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Soham. And I can't agree more with what you presented, especially the collaborative um, projects which I had the um, uh, the an opportunity to kind of introduce the first a collaborative study to, to Palestine, uh, which is Global Surge, and I will talk a little bit about it. Um, just give me a few seconds to share my screen. Um, okay, so uh, again, my name is Osei Dissel, and I I I'm one of the co-founders and uh, board members of Oxbal version two. Um, we started in 2011 and I, we stopped a little bit in, in 2018 uh, and we went back. Uh, so hopefully we would continue offering um, sort of research lectures, um, educational uh, lectures on clinical um, subjects. And um, more recently, we introduced a virtual curriculum, which is um, something very exciting. And I would recommend everybody to, to take a look at it. Um, so um, I started my journey from, from Gaza, where I uh, was raised uh, and um, where I studied medical school and, and uh, you know, moved to, 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 the, uh, to, to the UK to, to continue my journey and now in the US. And I'm, I'll, I'll just sort of summarize my, my journey in this um, slide. And, and the idea is to just kind of, um, you know, share my experience with people and to 
kind of um, share what I have done in terms of um, research and uh, teaching activities. So I, I did my high school um, in, in Gaza Strip, and then I started medical school uh, at the Islamic University of Gaza. We have a six year uh, curriculum for those who don't know, uh, which is quite similar to the UK system, but we have one more year. Um, we don't have an intercalated year as um, Soham mentioned. Um, so we have three years of basic science and three years of um, clinical science. Um, and then I worked as, a, uh, as an intern um, at, at the Minister of Health in, in Palestine and worked for a short period of time as a teaching um, uh, assistant at the medical school. And then because I wanted to expand on my research and teaching experiences, I moved to London where I worked as a teaching and research uh, fellow at the Queen Mary University of London. So I worked in a uh, simulation lab in uh, microsurgery. Um, and then I got the scholarship to study a master's degree in musculoskeletal sciences and, bi and biomedical data science. Um, and that was from 2018 to 2019. Um, and then finally, I'm, uh, I moved to, to Boston where I'm currently uh, in um, and I'm now doing research at uh, Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, and I will be moving uh, to, um, to, to do my residency in, in surgery uh, in June this year. Okay, so um, I'll start with, uh, with Gaza where I um, start my journey. And I'll just share some of uh, my publications and uh, give a few tips uh, on how to do it and how to kind of start doing research. Um, and the, the, this lecture is mostly made to share our experience with uh, medical students who are in Palestine, but I'm sure this would apply to anybody in low to middle income countries where there are very limited resources to do research. So this is my first uh, publication. It wasn't a full publication. It was an abstract that was published in The Lancet. And for those who don't know, The Lancet ha uh, established an initiative called The Lancet Palestinian Health Alliance or LDHA. And every year they have a, a conference in Beirut, in Lebanon or Amman in Jordan and sometimes in the West Bank. And the idea is to encourage um, early career researchers to, uh, to do research and present at the conference and um, publish their um, research um, as a, as a uh, supplement in the Lancet. Um, so although this was a, a cross-sectional study and I know some students sort of sought to discourage people from doing it, I think starting with a, with a, a cross-sectional study or a very simple sort of study design, I think it, it is still valid and, and many people do it. So don't be discouraged from doing a cross-sectional studies. Um, and um, I would give credit to Dr. Ala al Masri and Dr. Uh, Hamid Silesi who uh, sort of supervised this project. And I would really encourage people to, to join them to kind of if, if they have any research question that they would like to, to answer. And then as Zoham mentioned, uh, the, 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 uh, I really recognize the importance of uh, collaborative studies, especially those uh, related to global surgery. And we sort of, when I returned back from Oxford, when I did my elective back in 2015, um, I got to kind of attend one of the um, uh, Star Surge uh, Collaborative, which is sort of a UK based um, collaborative group for medical students um, and then they uh, started um, uh, global search a few months ago so um, I, 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 I kept in touch with those people and then in, uh, with the help of some of my colleagues from the West Bank I introduced the uh, global search to study and in this study we looked at the um, epidemiology of surgical site infection following GI uh, surgery and we uh, we had more than 60 participants, most of them were medical students from Gaza and West Bank, and all of them got co-authorship uh, co in the Lancet infectious disease. Although the contribution was mostly in data collection, I think the, the, that experience for me, uh, co-leading the study, and I'm sure what I've heard from medical students was fantastic, because it sort of introduced that principle to them and then they participated in other um, collaborative studies later on, which also involved uh, more of um, local capacity building, uh, especially global feed search studies. 
Um, and we publish sort of a uh, um, um, our uh, Palestine data and presented it in uh, the Lands of Palestinian uh, Alliance conference in, in the following year uh, on behalf of uh, Global Search to Palestine uh, collaborators. Now, I'm, when I moved to London, um, as I mentioned, I worked in a simulation lab where I got exposure to, um, to uh, simulation training, especially in microsurgery. Um, and also um, got the opportunity to work in an aesthetic medicine group. Um, and uh, the, the first uh, publication that I uh, published uh, during my time in London was a, a literature review. And this was my first literature review to do. Um, and we basically summarized the evidence behind the use of uh, PRP in scar management. Um, and I've learned a lot because literature review is something very easy to do. And you can do it while you are in Palestine because you don't need uh, really a database. You can find the uh, publications from um, from PubMed basically or other um, databases. So I think that's something to consider. So cross-sectional studies and uh, literature reviews, I think these are very important things to do early on. And the skills you learn, you can translate them in any uh, research project that you do later on. And then we also work on a, a simulation model Basically, this model is a silicon model that was made by the MIT, where you have vein, artery, and nerve at the same time, uh, and uh, we kind of gave it to tra plastic surgery trainees in, in London, and we evaluated their uh, feedback, um, and uh, we published that paper in the, in the European Journal of Plastic Surgery. Now, moving to Oxford, I did a master's degree, and uh, for those who don't know, for master's, you have to do either dissertation or, um, um, yeah, mostly dissertation and or thesis if you are doing a, a, a master's by research, which is kind of similar to a PhD, but it's for one or two years. Um, so in each chapter, uh, you kind of write on a different things, but the entire uh, thesis or dissertation is kind of connected to, to each other. So this, is, this came out of my first chapter of my master's uh, thesis and basically this is my first systematic review in which we summarize the uh, non-genetic risk factors uh, associated with the Butrans disease. And then the second paper, uh, and I'm uh, highlighting it here because this is the first time I used a, a large database. So a large database, basically a, um, um, a database that has thousands and sometimes millions of patients. And this is the largest uh, database from uh, England. It's called HIS database. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of databases, and actually, I, I can't think of anyone, any any data data set in in in, the Palestine, in Palestine. But I know, I think in West Bank, uh, people are starting to create a, a cancer registry, which is something uh, exciting. And I hope to have more databases because this is the sort of the the future of medicine in, in Palestine. So we looked at the serious systemic complications and local complications following the Butrin disease surgery in, in England, and we published this in Nature Scientific Reports. Now in Boston, uh, what I'm currently working uh, um, at is basically trauma and acute care surgery projects, but uh, with the COVID pandemic, we shifted gears and we started doing COVID-19 research. And this is one of my uh, publications in which we looked at the uh, predictors of mortality in, in uh, patients with COVID-19 who were admitted to the ICU. And as you can see, we have a lot of authors because they helped in so many different aspects of the uh, uh, project in data collection, uh, analysis, writing, um, um, etc. And I think it's fine as long as they kind of contribute uh, um, to, to the paper. And that's, that also applies to any collaborative uh, projects. And then finally, this is one of the largest, uh, actually the largest study that looked at the impact of COVID-19 on surgery. Um, so uh, I helped with the um, um, sort of um, co-leading the, 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 uh, the COVID, COVID surge study in the US and helping the data collection and in the dissemination committee. And I'm glad to, to see uh, medical students from Gaza and West Bank who uh, sort of collected data from Palestine. And I think that this is very important to kind of um, highlight the, the outcomes in Palestine, because in, if you look at the literature, you see very, very few papers that, um, that comes from, uh, papers that come from Palestine. So I would encourage people to, 
uh, contribute to da uh, with data to, to, to these collaborative uh, studies. Um, so just final words, and I'm sure uh, uh, Suhan mentioned a few of them, and uh, some of my colleagues in the next lecture will mention these, but these are my sort of uh, tips for medical students who are thinking of doing research. First, research is extremely important. Um, it is important for you as a person to kind of dev develop your critical thinking uh, skills. It's also important for your professional development because uh, it is important if you want to apply for higher uh, training, whether it's in surgery, medicine, etc. Um, and especially in competitive specialities, if you don't do research, it's very hard to, to get into these uh, um, training opportunities. It is important, as you know, for patients because we help uh, research helps in answering um, important questions. And, and I'll give an example, COVID-19, and now there are so many studies that are trying to, to, to see which vaccine is better, which you know, uh, treatment modality you know, improve um, survival in those patients, etc. And it is important for the community because when you do research, you try to you know, help patients and also help in um, developing critical thinking for people who are doing research and uh, engaging with patients who are suffering from these uh, illnesses. Um, and, and I would recommend people to just do anything at medical school. Like, don't try to just say, well, I want, I'm only interested in surgery, so I'm trying to focus on surgery. Yeah, that can be right, especially when you are in a um, high income country like the UK or the US, because you have a lot of opportunities and resources. But sometimes, especially in Palestine, and other low to middle income countries, sometimes you don't have that luxury. So if you if you find any sort of research project that you, you, you are still interested in, just do it, just help with it. Don't try to be picky and select one, uh, one sort of area. However, when you become more senior, for example, in the Finnish medical school and you start your training, you can definitely focus on a specific area. And that's what most people do. Uh, for example, I'm interested in um, surgery. Uh, so I used to do some non-surgical sort of uh, research projects, but now I'm trying to focus on surgical research projects. Um, and also, there's some sort of misconception by many students, uh, at least in Palestine, that in order to publish, you have to be the first author. Yes, if you contribute enough and uh, you led the project, you should be the first author. But if you held, you know, in data collection or something not major, I would say, then it's fine to be second, third author, etc. Um, so this is important to, to, to mention here because people say, well, you know, like if you are second or third author, this doesn't count. No, it counts, of course, because it is a publication and your name on it. And finally, as I mentioned, try to be involved in collaborative projects, try to help people. Don't say yes, unless, you know, sorry, don't say no, unless the project is like really uh, not, it's not going to help you in the, in the future, but try to kind of be open to any uh, opportunities. I'm sorry for taking much uh, more than the time I expected, but um, uh, I hope uh, these sort of um, uh, tips uh, would help you in the, in the future. I'm happy to take any questions uh, and, and I will try to answer them in the chat. And yeah, feel free to kind of uh, ask any questions later in the Q&A session. Um, thank you so much. And I will give the mic to Boha. Okay. Um... First of all, thank you, Oxpad, for the invitation. I'm honored to be here speaking and sharing my experience among those amazing researchers, Dr. Saham, Dr. Said, and of course, Dr. Rose. Um, before I start uh, sharing my journey with you guys, I have two warnings for you. First of all, through the journey, I had a lot of fails. I, I cried a lot. I've been evicted more than you think, and I've dealt with Experience. had bad experience, um, learned my tough lessons, but with a lot of coffee and beloved friends and family members, I have survived and I'm here now. The second warning is that um, I, you will hear me saying that I have worked. Uh, keep in mind that it's in, I, all, all what I'm doing is in voluntary basis. So I never get paid to do something in research. So let's begin. Um, basically, my journey began in 2015. I finished Tawjihi and uh, the famous 
famous question is what you go, are going to study Doha after you get this amazing uh, mark uh, 98.7 and I the old wise me said I'm going to med school but the little girl inside me kept saying always remember that you always imagined yourself as a scientist but anyways I went through med school and I'm ready to become the future doctor of the family so yeah um and actually my first opportunity the first opportunity came for me in 2017 when i uh, showed my interest to dr walid basha that i am interested in doing research actually uh, and i had the chance to uh, be a trainee in the microbiology lab and in the animal unit where i get introduced to the animal unit worked with the animal there, specifically talking with mice, little white mice. I've learned how to take care of them, how to feed them, how to dissect them, how to take blood samples and how to cut their tails. Um, and actually uh, we've worked there, I've worked and the trained of their like saying of six month uh, period from February to August, 2017. Um, I've, lot, I've got a lot of experience up there. Then um, at August, I've got another opportunity of being at the molecular biology lab. Uh, and it was a great opportunity as it was an, a hands-on uh, opportunity. Uh, the, the interesting thing about it that it was directed for uh, medical laboratories and biotechnology students. Uh, but I introduced myself to Dr. Saad al Ham and I said, I'm interested in doing lab research uh, and I'm ready to commit to such a training. And um, he um, accepted me as a participant in the training on the molecular biology lab. And I had, uh, I've been introduced to how to do DNA extraction. I've done it by my hands, ELISA and all the cool things that you can do by bipeds and droppers in the biology lab. Um, so 2017 was rich of experience, but when I, 28, when I, when we reached in 2018, um, no opportunity came for me actually to do anything related to research. Um, but I told myself that Doha should do something. Uh, so I took the concept of read, watch and listen. Do I use all your senses to learn research? Even you are, even you are not finding the source to learn, like a course or a mentor or something like that. So I use all the things you are, you are seeing up there. Coursera, Coursera, it's a planet of courses, beneficial courses you can find up there, and you can get all the knowledge from there. Even though you can, you don't worry about the certificate. Actually, just take the knowledge. Uh, YouTube, Stanford University courses also. Also, I had um, done a LinkedIn with uh, account uh, so to grow my network, to get introduced to more people, researchers, Palestinian ones inside Palestine, outside Palestine, uh, to get involved in this um, networking of the professional network. Also, I had LabRoots, uh, if you know this guy's LabRoots uh, account and ORCID ID. Um, so this is, was 2018 for me. Um, yeah, 2019 was a generous year for me because um, I've met a lot of amazing people uh, in 2018 at Najah University, at Pierre Zayt, at Al Quds University. But they were two amazing people that really believed in um, little Duha and the researcher attitude in me. Uh, those two people were Dr. Zahir Nazal and Dr. Iman Shawish. Um, they actually helped me a lot to grow up my knowledge, uh, even though that I was really a beginner, but they believed in, the, in my abilities. Um, and I used to go with Dr. Zahir in each lecture that he have done. Uh, for example, if he is doing lectures for med students uh, outside my course, if he is doing something for internal medicine residents, at a Najah National uh, Teaching Hospital, if he is going to give also research lectures for family residents, uh, family medicine residents. Um, so I've been everywhere with him. And also in 2019, I also 
as Dr. Usaid mentioned, the LBHA. LBHA always held meetings uh, and courses uh, related to various topics in research. Uh, I get used to go there. I got introduced to Dr. Abdul Latif Al Husseini, Dr. Rita Rehman. So, uh, and I get introduced to a lot of amazing researchers in Palestine. And also to mention, of course, Dr. Emma Shawish, that uh, Iman Shawish, that gave me a lot of her time. Um, so, yeah. Besides that, I'm specifically saying in March 2019, Doha started to thinking in a another way, which is uh, let's think in another dimension. You are you were working for yourself. Now let's work in creating that atmosphere for others to begin to learn and to share their experiences in research. So 2019. Um, yeah, in 2019, things get to start to be more fast for me as um, uh, we have established the community. Uh, we, we have named it the Research Community of Palestine, the researchers. Um, as I believed, I can share what I've learned or a, a little bit of my sharing, a little bit of my experience. I bring all these expertise to help other students who are facing difficulties in learning or doing research. So you can see three at the top, uh, three different pictures from three different cities. You can see from your right, from the right, uh, um, a workshop conducted in Gaza, held by Dr. Khamis al Issey in the middle, uh, at Nablus in Najah National University by Dr. Um, Zahir. At, uh, and the third picture is uh, in Jericho. This is our team, and this uh, training was held. Um, we were, by the way, organizers, trainee, and the trainers in, in these sessions with Birzeit University and Al Quds University. At the bottom, you can see the poster of um, the, the third undergrad research conference, and I became an ambassador for the conference. So, yeah, we start pulling the interested and to share experience. Um, 2020 was a more generous, generous year for me. Um, I've been chosen to be the Palestine, the Palestine ambassador at the International Journal of Medical Students. Uh, and then I've been upgraded to become uh, a student editor. Because uh, as ambassador, you don't do that much uh, things related to research. So I applied to being an editor and I've been accepted. Then I also uh, participated as a focal point for the Palestinian Forum of Biomedical Research, because unfortunately, because of Corona, we didn't have the conference. Um, and also, at May 2020, I've uh, been chosen as a student ambassador, ambassador at their program for medical students. By the way, they held, they have program uh, for medical students and nursing students. I encourage you all to contact them and try to um, apply. So yeah, 2020 still here. Um, of course, as a Elsevier ambassador, you get uh, amazing stuff. If you can see at the middle, uh, I got the chance to review uh, the famous book of Robbins that we all use as a reference book in our pathology lectures. So I received it from UK and I have reviewed it uh, and I gave my review as a student and giving my student pers perspective um, at this book. Uh, and you can see also that I have received a little beautiful package uh, as an ambassador. All my colleagues in the ambassadorship re receive it uh, at the end of 2020, but uh, unfortunately, and uh, a part of being Palestinian, I received it at uh, February the 1st. So whatever, it's here now. I use it. I use the mask. Uh, also, you can see uh, my Web of Science Researcher ID, which I also encourage you to do it, even you don't have um, published yet. But um, also, you can see that I have become Babylon's academic graduate. I will talk about it uh, later on. But 2020 was full of beer reviewing. I have worked as a beer reviewer for a lot of uh, uh, articles submitted to the IJMS and do book reviews. Cool, isn't it? So also, 2020 was the year when I first did publish uh, research. Uh, I've been 
honored to be in the list of authors for this commentary or policy analysis related to corona situation. The title of the research was Health Systems Response to COVID-19 Pandemic in Conflict, sitting with amazing researchers in the public health field, such as Dr. Muhammad Al Khaldi, Risha Qaluti, Aisha Al Basuni, Hamza Muri, and all of them, by the way, from Gaza. Uh, 2020 was full of uh, submitting work, um, uh, getting accepted. Uh, before the end of 2020, we get two articles accepted, and I have published one. Uh, the one I've mentioned. Uh, so, and also at the end of the year, I was officially assigned as the CEO of the community that we have to talk about, talked about. Um, and you can see the poster that having all my vision that been reshaped and um, sharpened all the journey from 2017 to 2020, making research a youth language, introducing a Palestinian youth to this culture, and uprising this, these skills that they have. Not because I know, but because I can. And when, when I do this, I help myself and I help them also. Um, and here we are in 2021. At the beginning of 2021, I became a certified B reviewer. I took my uh, Babylon's Academy uh, certificate. Uh, and also in, in February, uh, I've been assigned uh, as an associate editor at Hartford Public Health Review uh, Editorial Board. Uh, and I also do some promotion work um, at Hartford Public Health Review. Uh, yeah, I'm also, I am the admin of the page on the Facebook. So, yeah, um, that's, that's it. Uh, and this is me, of course, in uh, case you don't know me. And I'm sharing with you the question that kept me uh, driven all the way around from 2017 till this moment that I kept asking myself, so what is next, Doha? What is, if you have failed, so what is next? You have succeeded, so what is next? Um, and yeah, here you can see the whole journey the whole roadmap of my, of my milestones and it's well it will never end because i keep asking myself what is next um the hell um here it is and uh, feel free to contact me uh, and don't hesitate through facebook or linkedin or through my email um and of course here through the chat if you want to ask me about anything uh, i have been through or any experience that i have been doing Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Doha. This is fantastic. Um, and, and, you know, like, it's very rare for people like medical students and junior doctors in, in Palestine to achieve what you have achieved. So congratulations. Uh, there is just one uh, question for people to contact you. Uh, do you mind just putting whatever your email or a link to your page? Um, I, yeah. I, I have come across to the research community. It's a fantastic and congrats on on all the things that you are doing. Thank you so much. Okay, I will put it in the chat. Brilliant, you thank you. And sorry for not introducing uh, you. I, I, I noticed that, uh, but uh, thanks for sharing your journey. It's, it's very inspiring, um, so. Thank you, for no worries. Thank you so much. Uh, and now, Rose, can you hear us? Thank you I so much. Can. Let me just introduce you, Rose. I know, um, you have established Oxfell and uh, before I, I sort of took over for Oxfell version two and this is fantastic thank you so much for inspiring me uh, first of all and for being a, um, a wonderful colleague of mine um, so Rose or Dr Rose is an academic clinical fellow in geriatric medicine in London uh, she co-founded uh, Oxval uh, whilst a medical student at University of Oxford and continues to be on the board. Uh, after publishing multiple papers as a student, she uh, secured an academic foundation training with Imperial College in London. Uh, Rose then undertook a scholarship funded uh, Master of Public Health uh, or MBH in Health Policy at Harvard. Um, she was a National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow at NHS um, England and improvement. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rose, for joining us. I know uh, today was a very busy day, uh, clinical day for you. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to 
to come and, and share your experience with us. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to all the speakers that have gone before me um, for sharing their journeys as well, because um, it's very inspiring to hear from other um, current and aspiring clinical academics in, uh, in various fields. Um, I think, obviously, um, I understand we want to leave quite a lot of time for questions and answers, so I'll try and keep it quite brief and also try and focus perhaps on points that haven't been talked about um, by the speakers that have gone before me. Um, so, as I said, said, I'm the Academic Clinical Fellow currently working at St Thomas's Hospital in London. Um, and my post is currently split between um, three quarters, 75% clinical and 25% academic post. Um, where I'm currently working at the Department of Twin Research. And yep, back in 2012, I was one of the co-directors of the Oxpal version one program, um, which to date remains one of the um, most life-changing experiences I've ever been through. And I'm very happy to still be um, friends and colleagues with many of the people that were also part of that, that program. So I'll start with my research journey so far. I've not done very well at, uh, there we go, at animating this slide. Um, so I went to school in a place called Wells in Somerset, which is a rural part of the United Kingdom. Um, following that, I went to medical school where I did my preclinical degree, which in the UK is three years at the University of Cambridge before moving to Oxford um, for the clinical component of my degree. Um, and then moved to London to start work as a doctor. Um, and here I did what's called the Academic Foundation Training Programme, which essentially means that instead of just being a, a foundation doctor or an intern, um, you also have a built-in four-month component in which to undertake some research. Um, following that, I then undertook my Master of Public Health um, in Harvard and uh, Boston. Uh, as I was developing an interest then in health policy and management uh, and did a National Medical Director Clinical Fellowship to build on that management and leadership experience and then moved back to clinical medicine um, as an academic clinical fellow, which again is a split um, academic and uh, clinical post, so majority clinical with a small component of research built into it. Um, and then I'm aspiring to continued academic clinical career sort of working at the intersection of geriatric medicine and health policy um, so I think it looks it looks like a very uh, well planned and well thought out journey um, but as I'll talk about a bit later I think a lot of it is um, very opportunistic and it's not something if you'd asked me you go back to school uh, in Wells in Somerset I don't think I would have predicted that I would be where I am now as an academic clinical fellow in geriatrics in London. Um, so certainly uh, a lot of the path has been guided by chance and opportunity and by taking those opportunities as they come. So here are a few of my early research experiences. Um, so when I was a medical student back in Cambridge, um, I had the opportunity to work in a um, basic science lab, an experimental psychology lab. Um, where I was doing work putting rats into Skinner boxes um, and essentially looking at uh, impulsive versus compulsive behaviours um, as a model for certain uh, human psychiatric conditions. And that formed part of an intercalated degree, which I know has been talked about earlier, um, but essentially that's a built-in um, bachelor's degree built in as part of my medical school programme. Um, I think the first thing to say about that is I didn't particularly enjoy the research aspect of it. I enjoyed reading the papers and I enjoyed synthesizing the papers and the information, but actually collecting the data and analyzing the data, it didn't set me alight. And actually at that stage, I was ambivalent about undertaking a career in research. I then, I actually didn't publish any papers from that research block. Um, although I spent a lot of time writing up my findings, um, but didn't find anything I think that would be significant enough to, or I didn't view at the time significant enough to publish. And I think it's, it's good to emphasize that because I think a lot of um, early career researchers get quite despondent when 
the work they do doesn't immediately lead to a publication. But actually, this was a very short research period, um, and it's very common um, for this not to have a sort of defined outcome or, or um, to lead to a publication of sorts. In the middle um, is one of my um, it's work from one of my sort of first big research activities in Oxford. Um, so I moved away from the basic science research that I'd done in Cambridge um, and instead was doing some research looking at um, physical activity or exercise in patients on hemodialysis. Um, and this was a sort of mixed method study, so both qualitative, interviewing patients about their experiences of exercise, and quantitative, so getting some um, data via wrist-worn accelerometers on their actual activity levels, um, both on and off dialysis. And the idea was that this would inform development of kind of targeted physical activity interventions, knowing that hemodialysis patients fare better um, when they have regular exercise. Um, so that was that was eventually published, although again, um, it was a very, as you'll see from the date on the paper, 2019, we actually started the work in 2015. Um, so it took a long time um, to synthesize the results from that and actually get it published. However, I did much more enjoy the team I was working with um, and I enjoyed doing um, direct um, patient facing research rather than the basic science research. Um, however, knowing that, I still went back to doing basic science research when I became a doctor and the paper in the bottom right um, was on primary IgA nephropathy, um, which I did at the Hammersmith Hospital um, linked to Imperial College London, which is where I was doing my academic post at the time. Um, this is a review article, um, which I first authored at that time. Um, I think I wanted to consolidate in my mind um, whether I actually enjoyed research and what that um, what research I was best suited to um, and what I would want to pursue in my future career. Uh, unfortunately, that experience didn't actually do any of those things for me uh, in that I enjoyed the time away from the coalface, away from clinical medicine, enjoyed the time to think about problems differently, which I think research gives you. But again, I wasn't set alight by the topic um, or what I was doing uh, in the lab and actually left that thinking, mm, what, what next? What do I really want to do? I'll uh, come back to that. So I think in terms of sort of forks and bumps in the road, I've already alluded to a few. And I think one of the things I wanted to put across during this talk is that despite the fact that the journey often looks smooth and often looks well planned, i.e. okay, this, this step leads to this step leads to this step. Actually, I think looking back, there are a lot of forks and bumps in the road. There were a lot of times where I had to make a choice about whether I wanted to go down one route or another. And there were also times where I really did question whether I wanted an academic career in medicine um, and wanted to be doing research at all. Uh, and I think, you know, all of you probably um, know that clinical medicine is very hard work in and of itself. And the thought of coming home in the evenings and putting time aside to do research, to then submit to journals and get rejections or to not be accepted to present at a conference is, is very hard, hard going. And actually, you have to have a lot of conviction in what you're doing um, and also be prepared to come back from those setbacks and see them as an opportunity to learn revise your approach and have another go. So I've sort of picked out a few key sort of forks and bumps for me. Um, so the first thing I've put there is the academic FY2 placement. Um, go back. Oh, I think there's a back. I think somebody is uh, yeah. unmuting themselves. Let me try to. Um... Okay. Yeah. So just go to go back to here. Um, the this was the. Sorry, Rose, I think I muted. You. That's all right. I've just <laughs> noticed. I'm unmuted. All good. Um, yeah, so the FY2 placement was when I was doing the lab research looking at primary IGA, IGA nephropathy. Um, and at that time, I really didn't enjoy the lab research per se and wondered if it's actually what I wanted to do at all. Um, and actually, in some ways, that was part of my strong desire and motivation to apply to my master's in Boston. Um, and to move back away from kind of basic science research into much more health policy focused research. Um, and actually, 
I think the drive of not enjoying the placement drove me towards another opportunity, which was similarly research related or academic medicine related, um, but a very different flavor. Um, so I think trying to turn um, things into opportunities is definitely something to consider. Uh, again, I had a bit of a fork returning from Boston um, when I had a fantastic year, as uh, I'll say it will testify, it's a fantastic city to live and study in. Um, and then coming back to work again within the UK National Health Service felt for me like a step back to where I'd come from. And actually, um, it took a long time for me to think about how I could use the health policy experience that I'd gained in Boston to apply in a UK context. And actually, eventually, that was my drive behind moving towards geriatric medicine, um, which is much more holistic. Um, and also, there's much more kind of intersection with health policy and health policymakers, um, particularly here in the UK. Um, I think I'm also probably approaching a, a fork now, uh, as I'm thinking about doing a PhD after next year and trying to finalise exactly what research area and topic I'll be looking at and whether I want to do that in London or think about opportunities elsewhere. Um, so certainly some forks and bumps. And I like to think that the bumps can be used to uh, at least find a new opportunity, um, even, if, uh, you know, even if it seems rocky for some time. And actually, in terms of where I am now, um, I'm doing an academic clinical fellowship in geriatric medicine, and I still have a very um, strong interest in health policy. And actually, some of the research we've recently done um, as a group looking at delirium as a presenting feature of COVID has actually translated into national um, public health England health policy for COVID-19 investigation and management. Um, and this was actually quite high profile research, both on the, the national news and um, in the kind of Department of Health and Social Care here in the UK. And actually it made me realize this is the sort of research I want to be doing that translates directly um, to patient care and outcomes and also allows me to work a bit in the health policy sphere as well. Um, so I'm enjoying that very much and looking about, you know, for next steps to progress um, to sort of progress in that field and try and ensure that I remain well connected um, with the health policy sphere. So thinking about that, what would my top tips for you all be? Um, I think the first thing is talking to everyone. Um, so whenever you come across someone um, who is doing something, some sort of research or even something slightly different that breaks the mold of clinical medicine, just talk to them about what they're doing. Don't be afraid to ask them for a business card, for an email address, for a contact number. And certainly if anyone asks me for contact details, I'm always very happy to give them to them and to talk to them um, about what I've done and the pitfalls that I've come across and also any tips that I have for them. Um, the caveat to that being, obviously, you can't do everything. Um, so also think about what opportunities you are most excited by and what things you really want to pursue. The number two I've put there is, is enthusiasm and deliver on commitments. So I guess what I'm talking about there is, is when you do talk to people, do show them that you're interested. I think it's all too often, um, particularly at more early stages of our careers as medical students or junior doctors, we're quite reticent to show enthusiasm to more senior colleagues because we fear that we might be seen to be stepping out of line. But actually, I think if someone shows enthusiasm and commitment and goes above and beyond to demonstrate that, I don't think that can ever be a bad thing. And if someone perceives it as such, perhaps that's not a colleague that you would want to work with anyway. And again, I've balanced that by saying do deliver on commitments. So it's fantastic to be enthusiastic. Talking to everyone is great. But also if you do then say, oh, I want to do this project or I want to um, take on this opportunity, ensure that you do actually have the capacity and the time to deliver on that. Um, so try not to take on too much that you can't do properly. Um, that being said, if something feels like a stretch when you take it on, I, it's a bit out of your comfort zone or you don't quite have the necessary skills yet, don't feel that you can't do it, um, but do be realistic about what skills you have at the moment and how long it will take you to do that project. Um, I've put issues, are they fixed or temporary? 
I guess this is my way of saying when I was trying to work out whether I was or wasn't enjoying a particular um, project or research opportunity, I tried to break that down in my mind into what is a sort of intrinsic to this particular project and what is sort of more general uh, about research. So, for example, if you don't like a particular project because you don't connect particularly well with the supervisor or the senior that you're working with, that's something that can change and you shouldn't let it put you off future research. Or if you have a particular issue with a journal or a research panel or um, you're not able to collect data for some reason, that doesn't that's not necessarily generalizable to all research. And actually, that's something that's temporary. Fixed issues are things like if you if you genuinely don't enjoy formulating a research question or you don't really enjoy date learning new data analysis techniques, then I think a career in research or in academia is going to be challenging because those things are fixed um, and those are you know really important vital components of research. And again, if you don't enjoy those things, it's also fine to say to yourself, I'm not enjoying those things because there's many other opportunities within medicine that are not strictly research or academic. Um, and the final point there I've, I've put is be flexible. It's a little bit cliched, of course, um, and you know, it's hard to say what we mean by flexible. But again, I think research like clinical medicine throws lots of curved balls. Um, there's lots of things that don't go the way that you were hoping. The grant application takes a long time. Um, you know, the, paper, the journal rejects the paper and you have to rewrite it for another journal. Um, an opportunity has to be changed. And I think we've seen that more than ever over the last year um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, where a lot of research projects have been put on hold with a sort of switch in focus to COVID-19. And if you're able to change your project, your ideas and adapt your project um, to changing circumstances, that's a really good thing um, and will stand you in good stead, I think, for the future research career. So I'll uh, end there because I want to at least leave, leave a little bit of time for questions. I understand we've, we've taken quite a lot of time so far already, um, but I've got my contact details there. I'm on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle um, or my email address there, um, or you'll be able to find me. I think I'm on the Oxpal Facebook page as well. So do message me on that, although I'm less good at checking that, but certainly do take my contact details and get in touch if you've got any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rose. This is brilliant and very inspiring as, as always. Um, and, and, and I think your journey going through clinical and then research and then going back to clinical is just something unique. And it's very unusual in, for example, in Palestine and other low limited income countries. And, and from my experience, what I've seen in the UK and the US, research and clinical is something not completely separate. You could do research while you are doing clinical and you could do clinical while you are doing uh, research as on part-time basis. Um, so, okay, so we have a lot of questions. We try to answer uh, the, most of them in the chat box and we, uh, we've received a few questions through the form. I'll try to answer, to actually ask the panelists a few of them and then we'll have Tamir Nakhal who would like to share his experience in a few uh, minutes after we answer a, a couple of questions. So the first question I have, uh, probably for, uh, I don't know, anyone, 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 any of the panelists who would like to answer, what is the best time to start doing research while uh, you are a, a medical uh, student? So I, I would say there is no best time to start doing research. Whenever it's whenever you feel that you want to do something, you should do it. Is always my answer. If you feel that you want to start learning about statistics, if you feel that you want to start getting experience and collecting data, understanding the purpose of research, then go for it. Um, there is no one answer fits all. So, for example, some people that I know that I've mentored have wanted to do it from day one of medical school. They've been that interested in research. That's what they wanted to do. That's why they came into medical school. Other people they wanted to focus on their studies they wanted to learn about the degree on the last day of medical school they contact me and say you know what now i've learned about this i want to start getting involved in research both are equally fine as long as you're going through a path you're, you're at this webinar so you're clearly interested in research and it's not going to be the last day for you but as long as you're approaching the path that's appropriate for you do that 
brilliant. I, I can't agree more that uh, everybody has uh, their own sort of pathway and, you know, everybody has, you know, something in mind. Some people are interested in clinical, some people are interested in research um, and clinical. So it's just like, it depends on uh, the person. And, and a, a, a related question, um, probably it's hard to answer, but what is the best type of research to start with? Is it clinical? basic, translational, and I would like to ask maybe uh, Rose, since she, she, she has done both. What do you think, Rose? I think it's a very good question. Um, I think I kind of like to think of medical students kind of stem cells that are kind of undifferentiated. And then as you go through your clinical career, you differentiate more and identify what it is that you want to do. Um, I think obviously the most useful type of research um, is one that is in your clinical field of interest or pointing towards your clinical field of interest. But when you're quite early in your career as a medical student or as a very junior doctor, you don't necessarily know what that is and nor should you um, necessarily know exactly what your clinical area of interest is. So doing projects that are quite broad in scope, I think is a good idea and that can be um, it can be basic science, it can be translational, or it can be clinical. Um, but I'd say sort of top tips are trying, especially when you're a medical student, um, it's probably better to be engaging with projects that are already established, um, where they've already got the ethics, the grant, you know, grant approval, and the funding for the study, because I think as a very early researcher, it's going to be difficult for you to do those things without a lot of extensive support. Um, and actually, if you come across, you know, a study in a, a, a clinical, a, you know, a clinical study or a translation study or a, a basic science study that's already been established um, and it's something you're interested in, then I'd give it a go. And then actually by trying your hand at different types of research, um, you can identify what it is that you most want to pursue in the future and that you're actually most interested in. So I hope that's not a bit of a non-answer, but essentially, I think any opportunity that comes, try it keep your focus quite broad early on and then you can narrow your focus as you get to know what your clinical area of interest is um, and don't be afraid to switch if you start with basic science research and it's not your thing um, look for opportunities in clinical research later on absolutely i agree with rose and actually i know in palestine there are very limited opportunities to do basic or translational um, research um, i would recommend reaching out to people in the science department not like i know we are quite separate. We have medical school and we have the science school. So reach out to them and see if they are working on any research opportunities. And I would like to ask Doha because I know there's the neuroscience initiative in, in the West Bank. Uh, would you like to share your experience as to like what is the best time to, to be involved in that initiative or in other uh, any other sort of um, basic science um, research projects? Um, I think uh, the best time is whenever you feel you are ready to do um, and even though you have the will to do to learn um, and about uh, the research initiative uh, the neuroscience initiative it's at Al-Quds University but I hear yes that uh, medical students get the trainings up there and then been um, chosen to participate in uh, neuroscience field research but always make yourself ready I think that uh, sometimes I say I've been blessed that I didn't get published at my first try because I, I didn't, didn't have that much knowledge of saying that I'm really doing research. Um, don't, so don't worry that much about getting published as getting worry about getting the knowledge and to train yourself and to get these skills. So that's what I think we should, students should do. Brilliant, thank you, Boha. Um, and a question, anybody could answer it. Uh, what do you wish you were told when you were a medical student in terms of involvement in research? Or maybe you, you wish you could have done things differently. Maybe it's a bit of a sort of question. I guess one really important thing is choosing a right mentor. Um, something uh, that I learned quite early on is that mentors who, for example, just want to hand off studies to you might not be the most appropriate mentors because they don't really talk you through why, you, why you're, they're doing things or why you're doing whatsoever. 
they don't really teach you skills. You're more of a just uh, someone who's acting as more of a clerical aid. And while that can be useful, maybe once or twice, third, fourth, fifth, there's nothing you're gaining from it. And yes, while you might get some output from it at the end, are you actually developing as a researcher? If not, then try and think of a mentor who's really involved and invested in you. Someone who comes back to you in maybe a month or two and talks to other researchers about you saying, you know what, I've got this great student. I've got this great person who's been so involved. I, I'm, I'm really proud of them. And I only find a mentor like that quite near the end stages of my medical school career. And it made a huge difference to have someone actively support you, to actively go to conferences and say your name at those conferences. And it made such a huge difference down the line. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think the main challenge in, in, in Palestine and other low to middle income countries is that very few clinicians are interested in research or even doing research. Sometimes it's quite difficult, but I know in the last couple of years, many clinicians started to kind of do some sort of clinical research, you know, case support, case series, cross-sectional studies. Although, you know, it's like in the, in the base of the pyramid of evidence, but still it is valuable because, you know, if you even if you look at the UK or US, they did not start with clinical trials, like when they started doing this, they started with very basic stuff and then they advanced with time. And hopefully, you know, like the initiatives that, you know, Oxfam has been doing, you know, the research community and other initiatives to develop and uh, improve uh, research capacity in, in Palestine. I've got another question before moving to Tamer. Um, probably a question to Suham, since you have been involved in mentoring international sort of students. Are there any opportunities to do international, like to do research uh, from abroad, um, as in, for example, doing in Palestine, but with uh, help of supervisors from the UK or the US in basic science research? I know it's 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 quite easy to do clinical research, but how about uh, basic science? I'm not sure if you have done basic science research, but if you have here just any sort of collaboratives to, to do that. Oh. <laughs> Speaking outside of my area of expertise, I know Rose has mentioned she does basic science. I might just defer this to Rose if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Rose, what do you think? Is it is it possible, for example, if, if a student from Gaza, West Bank, or other, any other low to middle income uh, sort of places want to, to, to do research in basic science, but they want a mentor from the UK or the US. Does that work? Sorry, I'm muting. Um, I think it's a good question. And actually, again, it's slightly outside my experience in that I did not have a international mentor during my basic science training. Um, I and actually, in all honesty, I feel like I probably didn't have a mentor at all during my basic science training, which might have contributed, at least in part, to the fact that I didn't enjoy it that much. I worked with quite senior PIs, um, principal investigators in their fields, um, who uh, obviously had a very in-depth knowledge of the subject area. But to go back to what Soham was saying a little bit, I think sometimes I was used, perhaps or I felt like I was just collecting data with no real idea of the vision behind it. Um, I think it probably is possible to have a mentor um, who is in a different country, so in the UK or US, for example, um, as long as they're there more in a mentor capacity. I don't think it's necessarily possible to have a direct supervisor um, working in a, a different country um, when you're undertaking basic science research because I think you probably need more direct supervision, especially whilst you're learning the techniques and trying to understand um, how to conduct the research in the first instance. Um, so I think it probably is possible as long as it's someone who's acting in a sort of more direct mentoring capacity rather than supervisory capacity. Although, as I said, not something I've had direct experience of. Um, and certainly other types of research, I think it's very possible to have international mentoring and international supervision as well, actually especially if it's database research. Yeah, just, I, 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 sorry, go ahead. Tom. I was just going to say, yeah, really good point. I just remembered something, something that we do in surgical practice, for example, is it's telesurgery, where people in one country teach other people, people in other countries skills. I'm not sure whether that's something that Oxford can invest in, but that's the only thing I can think of internationally to teach skills. No, absolutely. I mean, I think Oxford and other sort of organizations, I'm sure like um, 
we are open to kind of any collaboration. Uh, and I've actually done a, a virtual elective in which, uh, which is quite funny because it's mostly lectures, but they sort of sent us um, like um, surgical instruments and basically they asked us to, to buy a banana. And then they sort of asked us to kind of do an you know, incision and do like simple interrupted sutures. Just kind of um, interesting and, and, you know, because of COVID, you know, I know it's really hard to do electives and hands-on experience, but it could be a, um, a temporary alternative, I would say. Um, okay, so I think Tamir would like to share with us uh, his experience. Um, Tamir is a friend of mine who's now doing a vascular surgery training um, uh, in the UK, who's originally from Palestine and he studied in, in, in Egypt. Uh, Tamir, I think, do you have slides to share or you'd like to speak? Um... Yes, I do have some slides, a few slides just to share. Uh, thank you for organizing this. Um, Said Rose and Soham and Doha, really nice um, kind of experiences, inspiring, I think, as well, especially for those students, uh, because each one of us was once a student and uh, had these kind of thoughts and dreams and inspirations. So I think it would be worth for me just uh, kind of sharing my screen, if you don't mind. So, um, yeah, my name is Tamer El Nakhal. I am currently a vascular registrar uh, at the um, Derby University, but I'm part of the University of Leicester trainee. Um, where did all start? Where did it all start with me? So the ignition was this, actually. Uh, how did I pick the vascular? Where did it go? It was through Charing Cross Symposium where as a student, as a fifth year medical student in Alexandria, uh, I was supervised by two mentors. One was from Imperial College and the other was from Alexandria University. And back then I had no clue what is research. I had very little on um, a kind of knowledge and basis on what is research, how to do it, etc. cetera. Um, so just as a re-grab, what is my journey so far? So I graduated from Alexandria University. And here as a fifth year medical student, I got involved into um, an article that was developed nationally in Egypt by one of the mentors who helped us understand how to collect the data and then afterwards how to write. And then we became co-authors and at the end it was published. And since then, of course, that Charing Cross Charms started. So. Um, one of the, I've approached, of course, one of the senior colleagues. I was very adamant, I'd like to learn at least what is the research and how to publish it. I wasn't as much oriented at back, at back then. So started with uh, simply gathering the data, afterwards writing an abstract, and an idea came up, why wouldn't we actually submit it to some sort of an international conference that would be tailored towards that research? And yes, it was accepted as an oral presentation. And here, of course, during my internship year, I did my internship in Gaza and I traveled to present that um, uh, abstract at the Charing Cross Conference, where it was actually a life-changing experience overall, because there I started to know more about the specialty. I got to know more people. I started establishing connections. And then I came up with the, doing, of course, my exams. And I got myself into a foundation program at the University of Cambridge, so east of England. Uh, and then of course, by each year, I was publishing along with other colleagues in the department, various articles, which led me to getting a core surgical number and at the end, getting a higher training number uh, in vascular surgery. So why I'm mentioning this, um, thinking about the whole story, how this all ignition started and from a little oral conference, uh, it just went through and helped me throughout my career and how research impacted my uh, overall performance. Even till now, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a few um, articles and publishing them in high impact journals like the BGS, the Alliance Set, et cetera. Uh, it just occurred to me that actually mentoring students via these little steps of uh, perhaps publishing it in an oral or a poster kind of presentation in an international meeting would enhance their experience, not only just uh, writing the paper from the very start, because it could be tough 
Whereas actually understanding how would an article from the very, in, very beginning of introduction, how the methodology to present it, and then afterwards how to um, submit it, and at the end uh, present it at the conference. Here, it start, I started with an idea of actually, if we go to the very basics and pick students who are from Palestine, uh, who have some knowledge of the basics in research, they have good English language skills and command, and some research writing skills, or without them even, then we can organize some sort of a course, even an online or virtual one, where afterwards they would go for writing the abstract of, of convenience, if it's in conjunction with my hospital or other hospitals that I will be working with. So that actually was the plan. So I was assisting, helping. We would share on Gmail our writing. They would write, ask, and then we would amend it. Uh, they would understand the topics. I have fourth year medical students who were writing about aortic graft infections. Uh, and then at the beginning it was a struggle because they didn't have the knowledge. But then afterwards, once they understood it, that obstacle went uh, down and we started kind of excelling into writing an abstract and finding the suitable conference. Once that abstract, of course, was formulated, um, submitting it to a conference was amongst us with a choice of which one would be the most suitable. For example, some of the most suitable conferences for students, and I do encourage a lot of students to submit to, is ASSET, Association of Surgeons and Training, if you're interested in surgery. Of course, there is the Royal College of Surgeons, Royal College of Medicine, uh, of Physicians, of course, all these, they have their own conferences. Um, and I'll give you an example. So this is um, a, a kind of a, a, an article that um, we were uh, writing in Gaza, with the students from one of the universities uh, and we've submitted it after, um, so that was when I was a core surgical trainee and we've submitted it to one of the conferences in Istanbul and it was accepted actually as an oral presentation. Uh, these uh, guys went and presented it they understood the concepts of what is actually introduction. They went into methodology. During the oral presentation, there was a, a very interactive discussion. And that discussion would formulate in their mind an idea of how to write that paper. Because and that discussion ignited um, the uh, perspective of how to formulate the discussion on an actual authorship paper, which will be published on PubMed later on. Similarly, recently, for example, even a poster presentation, um, I've supervised a fourth year medical students uh, who went through uh, a case report, which was in conjunction with the uh, hospital that I worked with, where they wrote the abstract, they did the literature review, they went through the methodology, they've clarified the pictures, and then they formulated the abstract. And the abstract was submitted to ACID, which was accepted as a poster presentation. Again, as a fourth, fifth, and sixth year medical student from Palestine, I do highly encourage doing this thing because not only it will enhance your knowledge and understanding of how uh, the very tip tops and basics of research are done, but also you will get to in, get involved into, uh, during the conference with other people. You will understand how the dynamics of the discussion goes on. If they tell you it will be an oral presentation for seven minutes followed by three minutes of discussion, that discussion will enhance your knowledge towards writing your uh, discussion at the end when you will be publishing that paper uh, in a submitted journal of your choice. And hence, I thought I'll, I'll just give a kind of tip tops and hints on what else to get involved in if you are uh, a, you know, motivated towards um, getting some of a research experience uh, and simply putting starting your career as a first, second, third or fourth year medical student with just something as an abstract and submit it to one of these conferences, it will give you a broader picture whenever you will start tailoring yourself towards higher uh, kind of level of writing a whole paper uh, and uh, then discussing the paper itself uh, before submitting it to a journal. So as I say, get involved and achieve. Nothing is impossible. So, and um, here's my contact. If anyone would like to ask any further questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I hope that this was kind of an overview and uh, an encouraging um, slides 
to show that you know you can start with oral or a poster and then carry on with the higher kind of uh, things as a medical student even virtually thank you so much samir this is brilliant um i really loved your slides and your experience and your mentorship although it was not part of an organization but you you could also sort of uh, build your own organization or maybe maybe sort of uh, joint forces and uh, collaborate with Oxfam researchers and other organizations. Uh, thank you so much, Tamir. Um, and that was a very nice summary for our sort of um, webinar. Um, just one final question for the audience. I know we are uh, sort of um, almost one and a half hours in, in, in our uh, webinar, um, but I, just a final uh, question from um, the, uh, for, for the uh, panelists. Um, how do you how do you find a balance between um, studying for exams and your clinical sort of rotations and doing research while um, you know studying while you are a, a medical um, a student? I think Soham uh, shared his experience. I would like to hear from uh, Doha and, and, and Rose or even Tan. Yeah, so I'm happy to go first. Um... So I think the first thing to say um, is that you should prioritise your exams um, because without passing your exams and getting through medical school, um, you won't be able to you know, become a future academic. Um, so actually make sure that you, again, it goes back to my point about don't take off more than, take, take on more than you can do at a given time. Um, and really don't be afraid to say to supervisors or mentors that no, I need to focus on my exams at these specific times. However, uh, I think there are times during medical school where exams are less frequent and or I don't like to say less important, but maybe slightly less important. So not not around the time of your medical finals, but perhaps, um, you know, the year before or something like that, where you have a bit more free time in inverted commas to explore research. Um, and also, if you don't get things done before your exams, you can always come back after you've done your exams and continue to write things up and try and get things published then. Um, so definitely prioritise the exams, um, but also look for times when you're not quite so busy with exams or when the exams are a bit less important and, and try and build the research in, in around that. And don't be afraid to tell supervisors that you have to prioritise exams. And actually it doesn't end because I just sat my PACE's clinical exam in October. Um, and again, I had to sort of knuckle down and not do anything else really except revise for that for about you know a good few months before. Um, because it's an expensive exam, so I didn't want to have to resit it, and it's important. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, you're always balancing exams throughout your clinical career as well. Absolutely, and good luck, Rose, with the, with the exams. Um, I'm not sure, Doha or Tamir, you'd like to, to comment on that? Yeah. yeah, maybe I would be the worst person to ask for how to balance, because I always get this question. Um, and I, I would be honest with you, and uh, on, in 2020, I've lost this balance. I've got so much for research. So my advice is, no, first things comes first, and your study is your priority, and then comes research. And as Dr. Rose said, that yes, your supervisors, of course, will um, understand that your study is way important than research as everybody knows that we have to, done, uh, to do a lot of work in medical school and as medical students. So yeah, choose your study always. Yeah. Brilliant, Tamir. Yeah, so I think I, I went through two stages. When I was a medical student and I wanted to publish, that was a challenge, of course. And then the second one, when I was a core trainee and I had to do the Royal College exams, uh, as well as I had to publish in order to get a number. And, and that was kind of a very difficult time for me. In order for me to balance it, I used to do a three, four uh, rule, which means I would study for four days and three days I would devote simply putting to researching. So that would be Friday, Saturday, Sunday for writing the article or submitting it somewhere, whereas the rest of the week would be um, uh, kind of get involved into my exams and and prioritize that. However, uh, one thing that I liked from Rose that she said is never shy out from saying, well, actually at the moment, I have this uh, commitment. I would be able to take on the other commitment, 
next time, for example, once I finish this. And this is very important in any research because we tend to oversaturate ourselves saying, yes, I want this and that and the other one. And then at the end, you, the end result is nothing. And that looks really bad on your CV that you actually got involved in five projects, but none of them were published. Uh, whereas if you take one project at a time and publish it or submit it somewhere and get it uh, published, then that would look good at you. So I think that's kind of my way of thinking around it. Perfect. And, and, and from my experience, I think it's tough. It's not easy, to be honest. Um, but I would recommend that you sort of, um, again, focus on your exams and at the same time have a, a future plan. For example, if your plan is to, let's say, you know, stay in Palestine, then you have to work for that. So if there are any, if there are any, if there are any requirements that you have to meet for that, like you know the Palestinian sort of uh, board to to kind of train, then try to focus on that, and along that you could sort of uh, do projects and all of that. If you if your plan is to go to the UK or the US to continue your higher training, then um, of course you should focus on your studies, but at the same time you should also focus on you know passing those exams to to be able to to train there, and you know for example. Like if you want to 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 get a competitive uh, specialty, um, try to kind of uh, also um, do research while you are a student, so that by the time you, you graduate, you are ready to apply. You have a decent CV. So try to 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 kind of have a long term plan that would enable you to achieve your dreams. Because if 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 you don't have that kind of plan, it's really hard to kind of. Um, to to be successful when you graduate because once you graduate you feel like um, you literally in a, in a, especially during internship you are in a maze and it's 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 just really hard to focus on what you want so if you have a plan early on you could prioritize things and um, and and you know build your career um, step by step. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, thank you so much uh, everyone for joining us. Special thanks to the panelists who stayed that long with us, uh, Rose, Jusohan, Bohan, Tamir, for sharing your uh, fantastic, very inspiring experiences. And uh, thanks for all the students. We have more than 140 students who joined us this in this uh, webinar. And, you know, just follow our Facebook or um, um, Twitter um, and our website for more updates. This, uh, again, this is part of uh, 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 the second online research fellowship. Uh, you will get a certificate when you attend. So that's something I know most people are excited about. And also don't forget to, to kind of fill out the feedback form. Rebecca has kindly put it in that chat and you will receive, uh, of course, an email to, kind of, uh, to put uh, your feedback. So please write anything positive, negative. We would love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much and have a good uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye.